Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a la Fundación Rafael del Pino con motivo de esta nueva convocatoria enmarcada en nuestro programa de conferencias magistrales. Hoy nos convoca un interesante debate promovido con motivo de la presentación del libro Acabad ya con esta crisis, cuyo autor es el profesor Krugman. Profesor, es una satisfacción para mí darle la bienvenida a la Fundación Rafael del Pino en nombre del patronato y de todos los que formamos parte de la Fundación. Gracias por aceptar estar hoy aquí con nosotros. Una vez más nos visita un economista de excepción. Ya son muchos los que hemos tenido la fortuna de presentar a lo largo de estos últimos años. En este caso, el profesor Krugman está acompañado de otros dos economistas excepcionales. Pedro Svartz, presidente del Consejo Económico y Social de la Comunidad de Madrid, y Manuel Conte, presidente del Consejo Editorial de Expansión y Actualidad Económica. Gracias a ambos por aceptar participar en un debate que, estamos seguros, no va a decepcionar. El debate lo moderará Vicente Montes, director adjunto de la Fundación. Gracias también a todos ustedes por acompañarnos y, en especial, la editorial crítica, editora del libro y a su directora, Carmen Esteban, por su colaboración en la organización de esta conferencia. Crítica ha publicado todas las obras del profesor Krugman desde 1997. El profesor Krugman es un economista académico al que le preocupa la crisis y sus efectos sobre el conjunto de la economía. Al mismo tiempo, es un economista al que le gusta el debate y que, para fomentarlo, no duden en escribir libros, como el que hoy se presenta, para difundir y defender abiertamente sus ideas y propuestas con frecuencia controvertidas, pero siempre ilustradas. Profesor Krugman, su presencia hoy entre nosotros ha suscitado una gran expectación. El interés demostrado por los medios de comunicación es una buena prueba de ello, pero también lo es el elevado número de solicitudes recibidas para seguir este acto en directo. Como puede comprobar, nos hemos visto obligados a ampliar el aforo de este auditorio e incluso a abrir dos salas en el edificio contiguo en las que se seguirán las intervenciones y el correspondiente debate por circuito cerrado de televisión. Solo debemos lamentar que la limitación del aforo, unas 500 personas, no haya permitido acoger a los demás, a todos aquellos que, que deseaban estar presentes en este acto y a quienes agradecemos su interés y comprensión. Las nuevas tecnologías permiten responder eficientemente a muchos retos con gran impacto y bajo coste. Hoy las utilizamos gracias a la autorización del profesor Krugman para transmitir este acto vía streaming con el fin de llegar a quienes no nos pueden acompañar y están interesados en seguir el debate. Desde aquí, un saludo a todos los que nos siguen en directo vía FRPT, FRPTV, a través de la web de la Fundación y también por las redes sociales. Como puede comprobar, profesor Krugman, su presencia entre nosotros puede calificarse como un auténtico acontecimiento. El profesor Krugman es uno de los economistas más leídos y una de las voces más oídas del mundo en el campo de la economía en general y en el de las finanzas y el comercio internacional en particular no solo en relación con el análisis económico, sino también en relación con la divulgación de las ideas. No hay duda de que se trata de un economista polémico al que le gusta el debate y cuyas ideas son objeto de adhesión y controversia. Por todo ello, The Economist ha sostenido que el profesor Krugman es el economista más célebre de su generación. El profesor Krugman se licenció en Economía en la Universidad de Yale en el año 1974 y obtuvo el doctorado en Economía en el MIT tres años después. Ha sido profesor en las reconocidas universidades de Yale, MIT, ha sido centenary profesor en la London School of Economics, Stanford y desde el año 2000 es profesor de Economía y Asuntos Internacionales en la prestigiosa Universidad de Princeton. A lo largo de su trayectoria, el profesor Krugman ha obtenido reconocimientos de primer nivel, entre los que destacan el Premio Príncipe de Asturias de Ciencias Sociales en 2004 y el Premio Nobel de Economía en 2008. El jurado del Premio Príncipe de Asturias reconoció, cito textualmente, su alta personalidad científica y social y la fecundidad de su obra investigadora, que ha contribuido de manera muy notable a sentar las bases de la nueva teoría del comercio internacional y del desarrollo económico. Cuatro años más tarde, en 2008, la Real Academia Sueca de las Ciencias le concedió el Premio Nobel de Economía por sus análisis sobre el comercio internacional y la, locación de la, la localización de la actividad económica. Además de los mencionados, ha obtenido otros reconocimientos relevantes, entre los que destacan, y no voy a mencionarlos todos, pues no quiero alargarme, la medalla John Bates Clark, concedida en el año 1991 por la American Economic Association 
a aquel estadounidense de menos de 40 años que se considere que ha hecho un gran, una gran contribución al pensamiento económico y al conocimiento. Desde el año 1979 está vinculada al National Bureau of Economic Research. Antes de cumplir los 30 años formó parte del Council of Economic Advisors en la administración del presidente Reagan. Desde entonces forma o ha formado parte del Board of Advisors del Institute of International Economics, de la Econometric Society, del Group of 30 y de la American Academy of Arts and Sciences, entre otras organizaciones. Asimismo, ha trabajado en el Banco de la Reserva Federal de Nueva York, el Banco Mundial, el Fondo Monetario Internacional, Naciones Unidas y un largo etcétera. El profesor Krugman ha publicado más de 20 libros científicos o de divulgación en las editoriales con más reputación internacional, así como multitud de colaboraciones en obras colectivas. Adicionalmente, ha publicado más de 200 artículos en las revistas científicas más relevantes. Complementariamente, ha desarrollado una intensa actividad divulgadora en publicaciones de la talla de Slate, Washington Monthly, Fortune y desde el año 2000, como colaborador independiente, publica semanalmente una columna en The New York Times. En su trayectoria, en su trayectoria académica y profesional, ha demostrado por ser una extraordinaria formación teórica, ser un keynesiano convencido, euroescéptico, un buen escritor, mordaza independiente, que no rehuye nunca el debate, además de un apasionado por la música. El profesor Krugman rompió con la ortodoxia cuando se mostró de acuerdo con las restricciones a las salidas de capital impuestas por Malasia en el año 1998 y sorprendió cuando destacó las ventajas de una inflación moderada en situaciones de exceso de deuda y del papel del gasto público para contrarrestar los perversos efectos de las recesiones económicas. Sus artículos criticando al presidente Bush por sus rebajas de impuestos a las personas con rentas muy elevadas o por los elevados gastos militares adquirieron particular notoriedad. También criticó a Greenspan por su fe ciega en la eficiencia de los mercados financieros en el contexto de las economías subprime. Y ahora critica la tozudez de las propuestas de austeridad por su supuesta naturaleza autodestructiva. En relación con Europa, considera que la falta de perspectivas de salida de la crisis se deben a la política de austeridad impuesta por el Banco Central Europeo y por la señora Merkel, sin que dicha política vaya acompañada de planes de crecimiento. Considera también que la política de recortes solo provoca menos crecimiento económico, lo que puede causar cierto estupor, pues una de las causas que nos han conducido a la situación actual ha sido la política expansiva del, COVID, del Gobierno, con el consiguiente impacto sobre el déficit público y la política de consumo e inversión impulsada por los bajos tipos de interés, que ha conducido a una situación de elevado endeudamiento del sector privado que compromete nuestro futuro a corto plazo. De sus críticas no se han escapado ni el presidente Obama. Y a la vez ha recibido críticas, incluso en España. Profesor Krugman, a pesar de sus afirmaciones de que hay una posibilidad real de que el euro se rompa o de que el riesgo no existe para España de una posible salida del euro o de que el rescate de la banca española simplemente evitará la catástrofe pero no garantiza la recuperación, a pesar de estas afirmaciones nos tranquiliza que considere que tras la última cumbre europea hemos mejorado nuestra situación. Su último trabajo, acabar ya con esta crisis, da título a la sesión de hoy. La Fundación Rafael del Pino, por deseo de su fundador, quiere proporcionar, proporcionar los referentes para el debate, para contribuir con su granito de arena a la formación de los dirigentes españoles. Su preocupación, la de nuestro fundador, queda reflejada en las palabras que están escritas en la pared que tienen ustedes a la derecha de la sala. No cabe duda que la de esta tarde es una buena oportunidad para cumplir con el objetivo fundacional. Profesor Krugman, de floor is yours. Well, th thank you for, for the instruction. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, this has been a remarkable, uh, uh, remarkably helpful time from at the, the, the Rafael del Pino Foundation. Uh, it's, uh, I have to say, it, I haven't had in much uh, time to see anything except, but, uh, except, except the foundation, but it's been a very good time to have uh, many discussions uh, while here. Um, and I, I, I'm obviously here. Um, to talk at, at, in large part about the, the new book, but um, I, I wanted to focus on the issues I think that are most relevant here. So uh, just a word, my, the book, uh, End This Depression Now, uh, is written obviously uh, in large part with Amer the United States in, in mind. Uh, so the, the, the first focus of it is on what 
what could happen in the United States. And, and I have some very uh, strong views about, about the U.S. situation and about the ways in which uh, the United States could very quickly be out of this depression if, if only we had the right policies. Um, but, of course, this is a, an economic crisis that is not just a U.S. crisis. And, in fact, the, the epicenter the, has moved to Europe. Uh, the, I, I sometimes say that we, we, we seem to be having a little bit of a competition uh, between the United States and Europe as to uh, who can do uh, worse in this crisis. And uh, I'm sorry to say that for the time being, uh, this side of the Atlantic, I think, is winning the competition, uh, although give, give us time. Um, but the, um, uh, and Europe is, in, in many ways, there are parallels to what's happened in the United States. Uh, but there are also some major differences, largely having to do with the fact that Europe is not a country, it is many countries, uh, but, but much of it shares one currency. And so there are special issues that arise from the problematic uh, creation of a single currency without a central government. Um, and obviously Spain, if Europe is the epicenter of the crisis, Spain is really the epicenter of the European crisis. This is, this is the place where the fate of the euro will be decided. Uh, so I, I thought I would try to talk about the, my understanding of the situation here, and, uh, and briefly, because we're going to devote most of this time to questions and discussion. Um, so let me just say a word first about Europe. Um, even if there were no problems about the euro, even if we did not have the problems of the national economies and the threat to, uh, uh, to Spain and the, the worries that the, the single currency might not be sustainable, we would still be talking about a very severe um, underperformance of the European economy. And just to the uh, Eurostat, the, the uh, excellent statistical agency, just came out with its latest uh, numbers. This is just a, a look at what unemployment rates look like uh, for the euro area and, uh, um, and, the, and the European Union more broadly. Um, and what you can see, of course, is that uh, there was a very severe, uh, very severe slump uh, beginning in, in uh, early 2008. We all know about that. Uh, but there was no real recovery. Uh, even at, at best, uh, there was only a slight decline in unemployment. And now unemployment is rising again. And uh, Europe is almost certainly in recession. Uh, so even if, if I didn't know anything about the problems of Spain, the problems of, uh, of, of the euro, uh, the problems of the banks, you'd be looking at this and saying, something is very wrong here. We desperately need policy. Uh, we, we need a new policy. This is not a successful economic story. And uh, um, it, actually, and, and it, at the moment, the United States looks better than that, although not good. So uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, we've had a, uh, it's not just that we had a severe economic crisis in 2008, but the fact that there has been no real recovery from that crisis. And at this point, in fact, uh, it appears to be uh, deteriorating again. But then, of course, on top of that, on top of that problem of the European economy sliding into recession, having, having really its highest unemployment since the creation of the euro, um, we also have uh, the severe problems of the individual countries within the eurozone uh, with the whole European periphery uh, in deep trouble. Uh, varying from the really very nearly hopeless situation of Greece to the uh, severe but one hopes uh, solvable problems uh, uh, here, and but but uh, but but very very difficult problems to solve. Um, and I came up. I wasn't actually going to use slides. I wasn't going to do this. Uh, but I realized after discussions over the past couple of days that that it might be helpful to just have a few schematic pictures uh, to, to illustrate what I think are the issues. Um, and um, by, by the way, that's part of the excuse, because uh, these are, I, I was not careful to make these beautiful. So these are, uh, these are some, qu uh, some quick things that I think will, I just hope will, will explain. So, so my, my view, my, the way I think you need to think about where we are right now in this very critical moment is that it's actually a problem in, uh, in three layers. And they, they look like this. From my point of view, the, the, the problem of Spain, which is not too different from the problem of Italy, though differences in detail 
Um, it, the the pro but this, the, the the problems we have now are there. There are there are three levels of, of problems. Uh, one of which is the problem of the banks, and of course that's what's been making headlines. Uh, so. Um, because the banks are, some of the banks are in serious trouble, they clearly need support. Uh, one has a banking crisis, a renewed banking crisis. Uh, not as bad at the moment as the crisis of 2008, but, but serious um, and, and creating great problems. Um, and by the way, that top, that top layer is what was sort of, kind of, addressed by the summit in Brussels last week. Uh, but we'll talk about the limits of that. Um, but if, if that were the whole story, then we would have a, a banking crisis and the, we would say, okay, what needs to happen is we need to have a, uh, the Spanish government needs to step in and rescue the banks, uh, preferably not the bankers, uh, punish the bankers, but rescue the banks and, and keep the financial system operating. Uh, but unfortunately, underneath that is a broader problem, which is the fiscal problem of the government of Spain and the fact that... Uh, um, it's not, uh, not able to borrow money at reasonable rates uh, for a variety of reasons, the, uh, which we'll get to in a second. The, uh, uh, as, as, of, uh, uh, as of just before I came over here to give this talk, 10-year uh, Spanish bonds were about 6.25%. That's a very expensive cost of borrowing. That's, that's not, a, that's not an, uh, acceptable, and that makes, means that Spain is, is not in a position the Spanish government is, is under severe fiscal pressure. So we have the problem of, of sovereign debt. Uh, that means, among other things, that the Spanish government is not in a position to rescue its own banks in the same way that the US government uh, is able to rescue its own banks, uh, or the German government is able to rescue its own banks. Um, and then underlying all of that is an even bigger problem, which is the problem of competitiveness, which is the problem that I think tends to get uh, swept, uh, swept under the rug, tends to, people don't want to talk about it, and yet it is the really underlying essential problem. It is the reason that the Euro crisis is so difficult to solve. Um, and, uh, and each of these, each of these layers feeds the layer above it. Uh, so Spain's fiscal outlook, Spain's current deficit is, is no worse than that of, of Britain. Uh, but Britain can borrow at 1.7%, and Spain is paying 6.2%. And uh, uh, a lot of that is because Britain doesn't have the competitiveness problem Spain has because Britain is not on the euro. Um, and then the fiscal problem, in turn, feeds on to the difficulty of, of dealing with the bank, uh, the bank problem. Um, what the European summit did last week was it had a, we think, a, uh, finally a somewhat reasonable solution to the immediate problems of the banks, which is that rescuing the banks has to be a European venture, that the, in effect you have to have something like the, the way, the, something like the TARP in the United States. We need to have money put into the banks when necessary by a, a consortium of European countries rather than by national governments. Three weeks ago, Europe said, oh, we'll lend Spain 100 billion euros and it will rescue its banks. But that was a disastrous strategy because what that did was try to fix our, my top layer there, but by worsening the second layer, by, by, adding, by making the fiscal outlook worse. And that was, that was a, a, a strategy that was doomed to fail. Now we have something which is more uh, reasonable. And that was the progress that was made last week. Um, but we still have the other problems. And the, uh, the deep underlying problem and uh, is, is competitiveness. Uh, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that Spanish workers are unproductive. I don't mean the, the structural problems. Yes, of course, their productivity should be higher. Everybody's got structural problems. Uh, but that's not, that's not where, that was true 10 years ago also. That's, this is no, no different than it used to be, uh, maybe better. Um, what, what's instead has happened is the, the, problems of a, the problems of having a single currency without a single, uh, a single government. Um, basic story, so I, I, I'm showing Greece because it, it makes a stronger picture, but it would actually look similar, though less extreme for Spain. Uh, once upon a time, peripheral economies were regarded as risky. They had to pay relatively high interest rates. Then came the euro, 
And for a while, everyone thought they were safe, and the interest rates converged so that the borrowing costs became the same, essentially, as Germany, which meant that money became much cheaper here, of course. And then, uh, then uh, after the financial crisis, people said, oh, actually, maybe it's not the safe after all. Maybe the fact that a country is not on the euro doesn't mean it's necessarily a safe place to put money, and the interest rates widened again. Um, that period, the period of the euro and of the low interest rates in Spain uh, in, uh, and, and elsewhere in, in the European periphery um, led to an enormous, enormous construction boom. That's the, that's the, the fundamental story of the last decade. Um, so this is the worst looking picture. Uh, maybe I shouldn't even say it, but Spain had an enormous, uh, uh, more than 12% of the workforce employed in construction. That is wildly out of line with, with what normally happens. And uh, now, it's not because there was something special, I think, that Spain was doing wrong. Um, interest rates were low. Spain is a, uh, uh, had expansion possibilities. It has warm weather. It has a sea coast. Um, the numbers uh, within the United States, the numbers for Florida look a lot like the numbers for Spain. Uh, huge construction boom, housing bubble then the housing prices crashed. The problem is that during that period of that great construction boom, Spain was a booming economy with inflation, with rising wages, not extreme inflation, but substantially higher than inflation in the European core. And again, scrappy numbers. I'm sorry, I'm actually using a US source for them. But um, uh, the, the, the red line is the uh, unit labor cost. Wages adjusted for productivity in Germany. The blue line is, is unit labor cost in Spain. And during those boom years, because the Spanish economy was booming from construction, costs rose. And Spanish manufacturing became, uh, became uncompetitive. Uh, and, uh, and what's happened now? The, so just going back to my, my three layers. Uh, what's happened now is you have an, a Spanish economy that is in big trouble because a big hole has been left in the economy by the collapse of the construction boom. Um, a hole that should be filled by an expansion of exports, an expansion of industry. Uh, but it's very difficult to get that because the costs are out of line. And that is the, that is the problem. So you say, well, OK, what we need to do is get Spain's costs in line. Um, and the strategy. The underlying strategy of the European, well, the strategy of Europe these past three years, basically, has been that we will get these things in line by having austerity programs and having wage restraint and structural reform. And the trouble is that that, uh, that works very poorly. It's, it's an incredibly slow, incredibly painful process. Uh, I, know, I, I know some people get mad when I say that Spanish wages need to fall. I actually just mean that they need to fall compared with Germany. Spain needs to be competitive again. Uh, and, but to actually get there by having your wages fall, is just, basically nobody can do that. People believe, uh, people say, oh, we will just have flexibility in the labor market. Nobody has that kind of flexibility. The United States doesn't have that kind of flexibility. Uh, countries that are being praised for their flexibility don't have that kind of flexibility. And this is my last slide. Um, just showing you uh, um, hourly labor costs, wages, just a, an index of wages in three countries that are supposed to be models for adjustment. Countries that are supposed to be, these are the countries that, that are really doing what needs to be done. And so we, we look at uh, uh, Ireland which everyone was saying is wonderful. The, uh, the Irish have done all, everything they're supposed to do. And in, uh, after three years of incredibly high unemployment, although not as high as here, but after three years of very great suffering, they've managed to reduce their wages only 3%. It's just not worth it. That's glacial pace. Uh, uh, Latvia is suddenly popular. Estonia is suddenly popular, which by itself is, that's telling you something, right? If, it, how desperate must people be to be looking for success for this economic strategy if they have to go to Estonia and Latvia to, to, to give them success stories. Um, and yet, even in the Baltics, there's basically been no wage adjustment, which says that this is not going to work. Um, 
So what happens? How, do, how, does, how, how can this be saved? Europe needs the same thing as the United States needs. It needs a stronger, more expansionary policy. Because there is no single government, monetary policy has to bear more of the weight. Fiscal policy, I think, uh, obviously Spain, countries like Spain can't do that. But, but Germany, at least, could be, could be doing some expansion. Um, but also, it needs a way to adjust this competitiveness problem. So I'll go back to my first slide. Uh, what, what, does, what, does, uh, uh, what does a solution look like? Um, I think there's actually a story. Um, uh, uh, solution is, first, the banks need to be rescued, but not by the national governments, but by Europe. And maybe what happened in, in Brussels last week says that we finally are getting that. Although, tell you, that was not an easy, that was not an easy communicator to read. Whatever, no one is quite sure what it meant, but it sounded like we might be doing that. But then you need to do something so that the, the governments are not under extreme pressure. Uh, something has to happen to make the, the, the borrowing costs of Spain and Italy not be extreme, which considering that, that you have basically a quite responsible fiscal policy, uh, they shouldn't be that extreme, but of course everyone is extremely nervous about the future. What could you do? Somebody has to be stepping in to support Spanish bonds. And somebody means actually the European Central Bank because only they have the resources. So bond purchases to deal with my middle layer. And then competitiveness, well, getting Spanish wages down, it's not going to happen. They need to be restrained, but they're not going to. So, uh, so if you can't get Spanish wages down, uh, what you need to do is get German wages up. And so you need to have uh, a little bit of inflation in Europe so that, that it becomes a, a possible adjustment. That's the story for, for Europe. That's how the euro can be saved. What if none of this happens? What if those policies are not there? What if, the, this, what if all we get is uh, an insistence that we must have austerity uh, and that the adjustment must all come through falling wages in, in Spain and in Italy? Well, the answer is the euro will fail. The answer is that, that although no one wants that, I don't want it, uh, the answer is that the entire single currency will fall apart, that there will in the end be a, a catastrophe, the outlines of that catastrophe are familiar, we've seen it happen. Uh, some of us cut our teeth on Argentina, uh, which didn't have, a, didn't have a euro, but it had the convertibility law, which uh, supposedly permanently pegged one peso at one US dollar, and that ended with um, uh, with a severe uh, slump, which you've got already, uh, and then political unrest, a run on the banks, uh, Coralito, and eventually uh, devaluation. And, and that's, that is a, a, a possible path. This thing could end it that way. But it doesn't have to, and, and it shouldn't. So there, there, is, there is a way out. It's the way out involves, but the way out involves mostly, thing, it mostly involves Frankfurt, not Madrid involves the things being done that, that are much more, uh, uh, that, that give Spain a chance, give Spain a chance to adjust. And I guess we're going to find out uh, in the near future whether those things happen. I mean, as, and so final word, as, uh, as, as an observer who cares about this stuff, every significant European meeting, uh, all of us who are following these wait in a state of great tension uh, we don't expect any single meeting to solve the problem, but we do know that each meeting could actually <laughs> destroy it. That, that one really bad, if, if there had been no agreement at all in, in, in Brussels last week, God knows what would have happened. We might be in the midst of a raging crisis right now. If the European Central Bank, when it has its meeting on Thursday, does not cut interest rates, instead showing itself to be just completely uh, insensitive to the situation, we could have a raging crisis on our hands by next week. And it's going to be like this. We're going to need to see positive action each successive meeting. We, we need, we, for, for, for two and a half years, we've watched Europe every time do underperform. Every policy measure has been less than, less than, than needed, less than expected. Uh, and we need to reverse that. From here on in, every policy move has to be better or, or disaster waits. And I don't want that to happen. I don't think anyone should. We want, we want to see this succeed. Because Europe, uh, uh, Europe is a beacon for the world. And we want to see, the, we want to see that European experiment continue to, to prosper. Thank you.
Muy bien, pues muchas gracias, profesor Krumman. Sus comentarios son el preludio de un ah. duda intenso. Sí. I left my mobile on the, uh, oh. <laughs> which is not a, not a good thing to do. <laughs> Bien, como decía, sus comentarios son sin duda eh, el preludio de un intenso e interesante debate. Eh, acabar ya con esta crisis, como decía el profesor Krugman, es algo que todos deseamos, aunque no existe el mismo consenso sobre cuál es la mejor forma de lograrlo. Eh, surgen muchas cuestiones, algunas de ellas ya las ha planteado el profesor. Eh, ¿Qué podemos hacer en una economía como la española, constreñida entre nuestra pertenencia al euro y nuestro débil crecimiento con esta terrible tasa de paro que estamos sufriendo? ¿Es suficiente la reciente decisión del Banco Central Europeo, forzada por el que el profesor Krugman llama el Latin Bloc, para eliminar la incertidumbre sobre el euro? ¿Debe Mario Draghi ir más allá de esta versión light europea, como señala también el profesor Krugman del Quantitative Easing, eh, en línea con la política desarrollada en la FED por su compañero de Princeton, Ben Bernanke? Eh, ¿La rebaja de la tensión de los mercados dirigirá el foco de la presión financiera hacia las débiles finanzas norteamericanas? Son muchas cuestiones y que van a surgir en el debate y, y para responder a las mismas contamos además en este acto con dos eh, de los más reconocidos economistas españoles, Pedro Svars y Manuel Conte. No puede ser de otra forma eh, porque un tema relevante como este exige actores también relevantes. Permítanme que haga una breve reseña curricular de nuestros eh, dos invitados junto al profesor Krugman, aunque son de sobra conocidos para todos ustedes. Pedro Svars es economista, politólogo, consultor de empresas y formador de opinión. A lo largo de su vida se ha caracterizado por defender la libertad individual, la democracia política y la libre competencia económica, con un altísimo coste personal. Desde 1970 ha sido profesor de Historia del Pensamiento Económico en tres universidades españolas, la Universidad Complutense de Madrid, la Autónoma de Madrid y actualmente ejerce la docencia como profesor emérito en la Universidad San Pablo CEU, en la que además dirige el Centro de Economía, Política y Regulación. Sin embargo, eh, su vida ha estado muy ligada a la London School of Economics, en la que estudió ciencia política y obtuvo sus títulos de doctorado, primero con una tesis sobre el pensamiento de John Stuart Mill y de máster más adelante. Es fundador de numerosos think tanks, fundaciones y otras instituciones que no voy a enumerar, de sobras conocidas, cuya vocación es la defensa de la libertad. Escribe semanalmente en el periódico Expansión, publica sus opiniones en el diario ABC y también en Financial Times y habla con frecuencia del escenario financiero y corporativo español en la BBC. Actualmente preside el Consejo Económico y Social de la Comunidad Autónoma de Madrid. Por su prolífica carrera académica, política y empresarial ha recibido numerosos galardones y reconocimientos, de los que destacaré solo tres. En 1990, la reina Isabel II le otorgó la condecoración de Honorary Officer of the British Empire en 2003 recibió el premio Rey Jaime I para la Economía y en eh, 2005 entró a formar parte de la Real Academia de Ciencias Morales y Políticas como académico de número. Por otra parte, Manuel Conte es, es miembro del Cuerpo Superior de Técnicos Comerciales y Economistas del Estado, al que accedió por oposición tras licenciarse en Derecho eh, por la Universidad Autónoma de Madrid en 1976. Tras su incorporación a la Administración Pública en 1979, ocupó numerosos cargos de gran relevancia, como los de director general del Tesoro y Política Financiera y secretario de Estado de Economía, cargos en los que vivió en persona la gestación de la moneda única que entraría en vigor más adelante, en 2002. Posteriormente fue vicepresidente para el sector financiero del Banco Mundial en Washington y en 2004 fue nombrado presidente de la Comisión Nacional del Mercado de Valores, en la que impulsó, entre otras cuestiones, la elaboración del Código eh, Unificado de Buen Gobierno de, la, de las sociedades cotizadas españolas, que pasó a denominarse desde entonces Código Conte. Dimitió de este puesto en 2007. Desde ese año preside el Consejo Asesor de Diario Expansión y de Actualidad Económica. En 2009 se incorporó al Despacho Internacional de Abogados Bear and Bear como Off Counsel y es consejero independiente de la compañía Cerinox desde 2011. Bien, eh, gracias a, a los tres por, eh, por haber eh, aceptado compartir esta conferencia de debate eh, y, y pasamos ya a, a entrar en el mismo. Eh, comenzaremos por una intervención de don Pedro Svás, a continuación don Manuel Conte y luego abriremos eh, eh, el debate con el profesor Krumman para conocer sus reacciones a, a los comentarios formulados por por nuestros invitados. Posteriormente abriremos el debate a todos ustedes y también a las personas que nos siguen en, la sala en las salas contiguas, que pueden formular sus preguntas por escrito 
y eh, también eh, incorporaremos preguntas que nos entren vía Twitter. Muy bien, eh, tiene la palabra don Pedro Vaz. Señora presidenta de la Fundación del Pino, eh, queridos amigos, profesor Krugman, I'm very honored to have been asked to take part in the discussion with such a distinguished uh, economist. And I especially appreciate it because he deservedly was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2008 for creating the new international trade theory and the new economic geography, which I've taught with his uh, Krugman and Opsfeld international trade text, which I think was a great text. Um, in, and also, he had lots to say about the speed of international crises. And he was, I wouldn't say, I, as a Eurosceptic, I think some of the arguments that he uses on the Euro are ones that resonate with me. Now, the trouble uh, with what we've just heard and what in general we have in the book I've read very carefully is that often Nobel Prize winners are tempted to pontificate on matters that are outside the speciality in which they have excelled. And they have this mantle of authority whereby whatever they say, whether it's sensible or perhaps a bit outré, uh, is accepted with uh, resignation from some and enthusiasm by others. Now, we've just heard uh, Professor Krugman say something about the euro and the situation of the euro today and the solutions. And I thought what he said was intelligent, practical, but exactly what usually is the case with the economists of this kind, which is they got us into this mess, and now we have to sacrifice our principles so that they can get out of this mess. So we thought the euro was badly set up, that the euro had some rules that had to be uh, uh, obeyed, rules that are similar to those of the um, of the gold standard, but uh, they were not obeyed, and we said so if they did that, and also the euro was used as a political banner. It was meant to unite us. My goodness, the job is not very well done. And so now we have the euro in a situation which is bad, and we ask the Germans, who know what it means to have, uh, to have an inflation, who know what it means to, be, to keep by, the con by their contracts, to keep by the law, we're asking the Germans, please give us a little leeway, please have a little inflation. We can't do what we ought to do, we didn't do what we ought to do, and now if you can help us and mess up your situation a little bit, then we can go along chugging with this money that we've invented. And this is what I felt in the book. It's again a book that uh, sees the situation, describes it, doesn't go into the causes, And the causes are from those are to be blamed, the people to be blamed, are the people who said the right thing, who said how we should organize a free society and how we should organize a society with a free market. And so, in the end, we have to carry the can, and this is what is happening with the Germans today. Now, when you go into his book, and I've read it carefully, it's a very well-written book, full of ingenious phrases, and I think one that puts his case in a way that is difficult to fight. Uh, when I read his book, I saw that he has one thesis. It's all a question of demand. Why is unemployment so high and economic production so low, he says? Because we are not spending sufficiently. When we all, when we all retrench at the same time, the economy stalls or contracts. My spending is your income. Your income is my spending. Therefore, in a recession, we need somebody to spend, and that somebody is who? The government. So uh, it's true that he, so he's looking at the super, su surface and looking at the short term. Uh, in the short term, we're all dead, said Keynes, and he quotes it. And Keynes, uh, Krugman is, it, it seems, interested only in the short-run economic growth Uh, achieved by redeploying resources that are somehow, somehow, we don't know why, who, who did it, somehow made idle by, uh, in this depression, which is inexplicable. And what we have to do is to put them back to work, in whatever way, with whatever fashion, inflation, no inflation, put them back to work, and then there won't be this curse of unemployment, which indeed is a curse, but again, it's not my fault, and not the fault of our school, it's the fault of other people who... Uh, Well, I don't want to go into that because we've discussed it into Spain uh, to, uh, um, to entireness. Uh, 
Now, my main criticism is, since aggregate demand expansion got us here, and it got us here by having two low interest rates, and those low interest rates were demanded by France and Germany, by Germany when they were uniting the country, by France because they're always asking for something which is not right, and they, they said, we want lower interest rates, and that meant that we in Spain had two low interest rates. So what, what inflated the bubble would, according to Krugman and other economists like him, and there'll be more here, I'm sure, um, what inflated the bubble is going to remedy the blowout. We first inflate the bubble with an inflationary policy, then it bursts, we have unemployment, and then we go back to the inflationary policy. And how, what kind of science is this? It's homeopathic medicine of the worst kind. You use, you, you, uh, your ailment comes from excessive demand, and you use excessive demand to cure your ailments. And I think one should go deeper into economic theory to know what, how to organize our world. Now, good theory says something different about sustainable growth. It comes from the supply side of the economy, not the demand side of the economy. In the short run, confidence must be built and funds must be freed, freed from, uh, from the, use, the use by the public sector, who very often is not very productive. Those funds must be freed so that uh, they go from the bureaucratic use to a productive use. And in the long run, Growth comes from increased resources, and especially from good institutions, and new knowledge. All these sources of growth, short and long, need individuals to set aside savings. Saving is good. Saving is good and not the kind of thing that's presented by Keynes and by Krugman as some sort of uh, a mistake because when you save too much, then the whole thing sinks. Savings and entrepreneurs and firms will invest them and with the help of a solid currency, banks and capital markets will intermediate. Now, this is the model we want to go to, and we don't need central banks who, who bring their interest rates low when there was a boom, and they've done that, they did that from, or I should say from 82 on, but certainly from 2001 on, and their interest rates are so low that we in Spain thought that money was there for the having, and we spent too much uh, on, on the wrong things. So expanding aggregate demand only works in the short run when wages and prices are rigid. It's true that Professor Krugman has said that our wages and prices are rigid, and it is so. Very difficult to make them flexible. So there's a period of pain. Uh, we didn't want this period of pain if we had done something else, but there you are. So now we want to see perhaps we need some kind of help in the sort he's described, but what we mainly need is to go to the bottom of the affair. How to create a free society with a well-functioning market where savings are not a mistake or a, or a sin and where savings are passed on to people who invest them and there's new knowledge and there's real growth. So um, I was going to say something about uh, the Great Depression of 29, which is not, I think, well described in, that, in the book. But I want to go to uh, a number of cases because it's very well to put forward principles. And we love principles. It makes for good coffee talk shop, uh, shop and, and, uh, and uh, coffee shop talk. And we need, we, it's good, but we need some observations. We need some facts to see perhaps whether one principle is wrong and one principle is right. And I'll look at Japan, which is a country that Professor Krugman has studied in great detail. And, with, and I've read with interest what he had to say on Japan, even if I didn't agree on everything. Now, the post-World War II miracle came to a halt in 1991-92, and I remember it well. There was a time when the, uh, the, the land of the Imperial Palace was worth more than the, whole, the land of the whole of New York, because the bubble was so big. So, in 1991-92, it just stopped. There was a fall in, in, in property prices. The, uh, the stock exchange fell. And, and then the, what did Japan do? Well, what they did is they tried to have inflation. They couldn't do it for reasons that are technical. But they, what they did do is to have debt and public expenditure and public works. The whole gamut of Keynesian of Keynesian. Uh, uh, solutions was used there. The result, 20 years of no growth, or very slow growth. 
uh, what the, after running a 2.4% budget surplus in 91, 2.4 surplus in 1996, it was minus a deficit of 4.3. 4 in 1998, a 10% deficit. And then the rate of national debt to GDP now is above 230% of GDP, 230% of GDP, more than twice uh, it is. And Japan is still not, not getting into the kind of growth that we expect from that very ingenious people. Uh, they tarried about these structural reforms. They didn't face what the banks, they had to do with the banks. And Japan is very much a place where the state spends, gets indebted, and doesn't grow. Then the US is not something I'm going to stop on. It's in the book. The book is really so interesting, you can't stop reading it. Uh, uh, it's good to read a book you don't agree with that keeps you awake at night. But this is very well written. And what, he's, what Professor Krugman says about the US, I needn't say much more than, how is the year? I'll finish. How is the year? I, I, I'm going to be in a solitary man. Yeah. Uh, how, how's the US doing? Well, not very well. And then let's, to finish, this, speak about the story in Spain. On July the 4th, 2007, the Spanish government started giving out baby checks of 500 euros to every new mother. That was 1.2 billion expenditure. January 26, 2008, bang in the middle of the electoral campaign, by the way, Zapatero returned to all income taxpayers, even me, 400 euros at a cost of 5 billion euros. This sum was equivalent to one fourth of the budget surplus accumulated before. July the 2nd, 2008, President Zapatero launched a municipal investment fund, the Plan A for Spain, 11 billion. Then it became sustainable economy plan with another 9 billion added to it, including 2,250 euros for each young man of 20 or, or, my, or lady of 22 to 30 if they wanted to leave home and rent a flat. The total of this anti-crisis expenditure was 34 billion. What happened to the Spanish economy under Mr. Zapatero? I needn't go into it. So the, the question is, if you want to run a deficit, public finance is a problem. Uh, that's a discovery. Uh, we never spoke about public finance, did we? Now, we need to borrow, and the, and the lenders don't want to give it to us because they don't. So what we have to do is to have Germany uh, start helping us so that they get in a mess too. The better way to bring your treasury and welfare state in line, I think, is realistic finance, uh, ethical politics, and a policy that yes. Professor Kruber might, uh, might criticize for being too conservative. Thank you very much. Sequential, yeah. and then if you want, we can uh, respond now yeah. or later. Yeah, let me just say, uh, yeah. I just want to say, <laughs> perfect. Uh, I'm going to say some, some mild things. Uh, uh, <laughs> I will say that it, it has been exceedingly disappointing how many people on one side of this debate have resorted to uh, um, attempts to. Uh, to pull credentials to claim that, that people on my side of the debate don't have the, don't have the intellectual standing to weigh in on these issues. Uh, and rather than, to, you know, that's, that, this is not an appropriate way to argue. Who did Even that? You, you, I didn't you do did that. This. You, did, you certainly did. I didn't. Uh, I said I used your book. I didn't. No, I didn't, did. I didn't uh, run you down. You, of I'm very you offended by this. Well, uh, I didn't run mean, you down. Yes, you did, sir. No, sir. Um, no, sir. No, uh, but, but the... Um, uh, the Honest. main thing I would say is that we, of the two views, that this is essentially a supply problem versus this is essentially a demand problem. I mean, in a way, nature has given us an excellent uh, experiment at, at vast human cost, but we've just had an experiment. And there were, there were and I do try to talk about this in the book, there were, there were really, uh, if you like, three predictions, three crucial predictions that, that differentiated these two views of what the nature of the problem was. Uh, one was what would happen to interest rates um, where, and, and let's leave aside the solvency issues, which is, which is what's going on here. For countries where solvency has not been in question, the question was would borrowing 
large-scale borrowing on the part of the public sector in the face of a depressed economy compete with the private sector for funds and therefore lead interest rates to rise. And there were some very harsh debates about that in early 2009, with many people asserting with great confidence that those U.S. budget deficits would lead to soaring interest rates. Obviously not, right? We actually have the very close to the lowest interest rates in history. Um, there was the question, what would large expansion of the monetary base do to inflation? And if you had a supply side view, you said, well, there's a, there's a certain amount of production and we're going to create more money, it's going to chase more goods, and it's going to lead to vast inflation. And that has not happened. Um, and then there was the question, what would happen with governments that, that for whatever reason, did sharp cuts in spending? Would that be expansionary because it released resources to the private sector, or would it be contractionary? And unfortunately, Europe has given us some very clear evidence on, on all of that. So I think it's quite extraordinary. Uh, at this point, the, the, the view, and I understand that a lot of people hold, hold uh, uh, Mr. Schwartz's view, but it's a view that now is being held in the teeth of overwhelming evidence that it's wrong. This has been as dramatically, uh, painfully, uh, a confirmation that a, that a broadly demand-side Keynesian view of the world is appropriate, uh, as, as you could possibly have asked for. Uh, it's, it's, uh, everything else is just an expression of faith in, in a view that bears no resemblance to the world we have been living in these past four years. End of statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Bueno, si me lo permiten, haré una primera presentación breve en español y después uh, haré algunos comentarios en lo poco que discrepo del señor, <coughs> del señor Krugman en inglés para que el, el, el debate sea más, más directo. ¿no? Eh, yo, yo saco la conclusión opuesta a la de Pedro Svart. Yo creo que al señor Krugman habría que darle un segundo premio Nobel. Se le dio uno por las teorías de comercio internacional, quizá ahora hay que darle uno segundo por lo útil que lleva siendo todas sus uh, uh, obras, en particular esta este último libro de aplicación práctica del pensamiento keynesiano a situaciones uh, recesivas, que él empezó ya a analizar, pues en el caso sobre todo de la crisis de Japón, en The Return of Depression Economics, y etcétera, etcétera. A mí me parece que el libro que eh, hoy eh, presentamos, o sobre el que hoy debatimos, es un libro ejemplar porque es profundo y al mismo tiempo fácil de entender. Eso es muy difícil de conseguir y yo creo que Paul Krugman es de los pocos economistas que, que logra transmitir ideas profundas, a veces demasiado profundas para algunos, eh, y, y sin embargo que sean, que sean fácilmente comprensivas. Para ello utiliza eh, la técnica de las metáforas. Una que le gusta y que vuelve a repetir en el libro y que a mí me encanta es la famosa metáfora de la cooperativa de Babysitting en Capitol Hill, eh, donde hace una parábola de una depresión keynesiana derivada de que todos los usuarios de esa cooperativa querían quedarse en su casa para ahorrar créditos para en el día de mañana salir de fiesta y precisamente porque todos querían mmm, ganar cupones en esa cooperativa, pues al final ninguno podía y es una parábola magnífica de esa, esa depresión que describió Keynes y que ahora, primero en Japón y luego en el mundo y especialmente en, en Europa, pues estamos viviendo. Yo creo que también hay otra idea que, a mi juicio, es, es eh, enormemente valiosa y que repite en varios pasajes del libro, que es la visión de la economía como un, una cuestión moral. Economics as a morality play. Y, y lo vemos muchas veces porque, a mi juicio, eh, muchas veces en las críticas conservadoras al pensamiento keynesiano y a su versión moderna en Krugman, en definitiva, lo que eh, son es un trasunto de juicios de valor morales que están camuflados como proposiciones económicas, pero sobre los que se esconde en realidad un juicio de moral eh, normalmente conservador que rechaza ciertas eh, proposiciones. ¿no? Por ejemplo, yo creo que Krugman, con acierto, insiste en este libro, en lo que él llama uh, the, the Big Delusion, que es la idea de que los problemas que hemos vivido en el euro eh, han sido un problema de excesos fiscales cosa que él acepta, que ha podido ser quizá el caso en Grecia, pero no el caso en otros países y en particular eh, en España. Y por eso él critica esa idea de la helenización de la crisis de, del euro, como si todos estuviéramos eh, sufriendo el mismo síndrome que, que ha vivido Grecia. ¿no? Yo creo que en el libro hay muchas otras cosas encomiables. La exposición que hace de la teoría de, de Minsky, el poskeynesiano, los momentos de, de Minsky, 
hace una eh, frase que, que cita, divertida, dice que parece que el nuevo pensamiento económico consiste en leer viejos libros, y, y precisamente porque eh, Keynes, por un lado, y luego, mucho más tarde, Jaime Minsky, pues ya eh, eh, ilustró estos problemas que vivimos en, una def en un problema de deflación por exceso de deudas, eh, debt deflation, como él explica con claridad, y eh, estamos en una situación eh, que él predica de la economía americana, pero que yo creo que es especialmente aplicable a la Unión Europea, que es los, los deudores no tienen dinero para gastar, y los acreedores no se lo quieren gastar. ¿no? Debtors can't spend and creditors won't spend. Eh, yo creo que ilustra también muy bien las eh, paradojas eh, eh, que caracterizan una economía en donde, eh, como él eh, dice, eh, tu gasto es mi renta, your spending is my income. Y entonces eso se traduce en una paradoja que yo creo que el profesor Schwartz no comparte, pero que yo creo que es muy cierta, que es la paradoja del ahorro. Eh, en momentos depresivos, ahorrar... Eh, salvo en aquellos países que tienen un déficit de balanza de pagos muy grande, como es el caso de España o Grecia o Portugal, eh, cuando la economía globalmente está equilibrada, ahorrar eh, es un vicio en vez de una virtud. Y, y yo creo que esa es una idea eh, keynesiana, eh, maltusiana, que, que fue verdaderamente novedosa. Para eso hay que tener una visión macroeconómica de la economía como un sistema cerrado, que a veces el que mira eh, la realidad con unas gafas un poco limitadas de equilibrio parcial conservadoras, pues no, no percibe. Eh, yo creo que también, al analizar en el capítulo 10 la situación de, del euro, a mí me parece que hay, hay, hay ideas muy, muy valiosas. Una, que es desgraciada, pero que es así, es que en la medida que los países que nos incorporamos al euro renunciamos a nuestra moneda, pues que somos vulnerables a un pánico derivado de, de que eh, podamos eventualmente eh, salirnos de, del euro. Por eso, eh, él dice que en esa situación, que un economista llamaría de un dilema del prisionero, precisamente eh, la gente eh, tratando de precaverse de un peligro eh, remoto, pues al final lo acaban causando precisamente con esas salidas eh, de capital y esos pánicos que se, que se autocumplen. Yo creo que el profesor Krugman tiene el detalle, eh, así como nos hemos quejado tantas veces de que a los países con problemas en el euro nos han llamado los anglosajones PICS, él yo creo que se inventa un nuevo acrónimo, que es eh, Gypsy, los países eh, que son Grecia, Irlanda, Irlanda, Portugal, España e Italia, que queda mucho más bonito que, 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 que PICS. Y, y en general yo creo que el libro está, está lleno de aportaciones interesantes, como cuando critica que eh, la Reserva Federal... Los, los alienígenas de la Reserva Federal eh, han, han capturado a, a Bernanke y Bernanke ya no dice lo mismo que decía cuando era un puro académico. ¿no? Dice que ha sido capturado por, por el, el Borg de, de, la, de la Reserva Federal. Es un libro verdaderamente encomiable, profundo y al mismo tiempo entretenido. Yo creo que solo por eso no solo valdría la pena comprarlo, sino también darle un segundo premio Nobel. Now, now I will turn to English because I have just some minor differences, uh, nuances um, with respect to what is stated by Professor Krugman. The, the first one which I also <clears throat> addressed to, to Mr. Schwarz is that contrary to, to this general idea, which is very common among Anglo-Saxon academics, um, that uh, the, the euro was a purely, purely political project. I think that's wrong. Uh, actually, the euro was negotiated among directors of the Treasury. I include it. And, and the main objective that we were pursuing was to have low interest rates, interest rate as low as Germany's. So there, there was a very clear financial objective in, 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 in just joining the monetary union is to, to borrow very cheaply. Unfortunately, and, and that was a curse in the end, and as Professor Krugman explains, we, we ended up with an euro bubble. And, and, and to that extent, I, I don't think the problem was with, with uh, interest rates in the world being, being, being too low, which probably added to, to our problems. But the fact was that we in Spain were not ready to, to such a low level of interest rates, which was the automatic result of joining the, the euro. And, and, and to that extent, our real estate bubble was the consequence of, of entering the monetary union, as, as Professor Krugman rightly states. Um, My, my main, um, um, the main risk I see in, in the theories espoused by Professor Krugman is what I would like the Murphy's Law of Economic Theory. That is, if a sound economic theory can be misinterpreted, it will. And that's actually what, what is, uh, is happening. For instance, 
I, I think Professor Kugman is, is, of course, very much in support of anti-cyclical deficit spending. But at the same time, I, I, I feel, I think, that he's also in favor of sound public finance, uh, as probably Keynes himself was. Keynes was very much in favor of the government uh, taking an anti-cyclical uh, position at the time of depression. But when, when you are close to full employment uh, and, and on, on a, on a, around the cycle, I think public finances should be more or less balanced. And, and actually, that, that's a very important idea because actually the constitutional amendment that uh, Germany introduced a couple of years ago and the one that we introduced last year is, is very consistent with this principle. It, it allows, um, contrary to a common misunderstanding, it allows um, anti-cyclical deficit spending, but it requires that you have a structurally <clears throat> Balanced budget, and and then my question is to 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 ask Mr. Krugman whether he he is um, uh, in agreement with this proposition that being Keynesian in depression is not inconsistent with being in favor of of sound public finance and in general of not preaching profligacy, which was probably um, um, Greece's uh, problem. Um, my, my second comment is on, on chapter 10 of, of the book, which, which is excellent. And the, the problem is that uh, Professor Krugman's book actually are two books, one on the US and then chapter 10 on, on the Euro and on Spain. And, 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 and you, you, you need to realize that when you move into chapter 10, you move into a different um, story in which not other uh, um, theories um, apply. But anyway, I, I think that the, the, the book is, is very good. An internal devaluation, something which he, he doesn't discuss, and might be worth um, seeking his views, is whether um, you know, through a so-called fiscal devaluation, we could help carry out this internal devaluation that we require. What, what essentially here we, we call fiscal devaluation is cutting down on payroll taxes and compensating that uh, decrease in, 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 in payroll taxes uh, um, through an increase in VAT rates. So that on, on, a, on a budgetary um, net terms, uh, you are um, in balance, but of course, you decrease the actual costs of labor by decreasing payroll taxes. That has been espoused by the Business Confederation here in Spain, and, and it, it's tricky because the, the, the VAT, the payroll tax, is, is very powerful in terms of revenue. So you, you need to increase the VAT rate very much to, to compensate for just a tiny decrease in the, in the payroll tax and las cotizaciones sociales. But, but I, I think that, that idea has been discussed many times and it's might worth considering. It's, it's, it's another bullet in, 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 um, in uh, a procession to, to achieve this internal devaluation. My second comment is that internal devaluation is not as unthinkable as um, Mr. Krugman seems to imply. Because first of all, in government has already been applied it's likely to be applied again. And even in, in public, uh, in, in private companies, it has been applied. Actually, in the Unidad Editorial Group, the editors of uh, my newspaper, Expansion, has been already put in place. Nominal wages were, were cut, uh, at least the first time, just on average, uh, by 3%. But it, it's not unthinkable. If, if we cannot devalue our way out of this uh, uh, mess, then we, we, we need to be creative. And even though uh, there is a wage stickiness, we, we need to realize that we are now playing a different game and, and we need to change uh, the rules. And, and um, also something which, which is important and is not uh, emphasized enough in, in Mr. Krugman's analysis is that probably the Spanish economy is, is a dual economy. So we have essentially a very good performing economy and, and probably some good performing regions, say the Basque Country and uh, Navarra, and, uh, and which have not been saddled by a real estate bubble. But of course, the average for the entire economy looks uh, particularly dim uh, because uh, you, you add all the indebtedness coming from, from the real estate bubble. But we are two countries, and there is one very proactive and, and effective country which, which is exporting significantly and, and is, is doing um, uh, pretty well. And, and to that extent, one might get the wrong message from Professor Krugman. I don't think his intention, his intention, but you may say, well, here comes Krugman, a Keynesian. Everything has been sold by government. And in Spain, it's, it's actually the, the opposite. The, the main drivers of the recovery should be companies and, and internationally exported companies. And, and that's something which is very 
clearly written in Mr. Kruken's book, but uh, probably if, if you take a cursory look at, at the book, you, you, you may, may miss this message because it's not as repeatedly told as other messages that, uh, that are mentioned. And finally, um, he, he makes um, some comments on the exaggeration of what he calls the, the confidence fairy, the possibility of budgetary retrenchment being expansionary. And in general, I think he's absolutely right, particularly in countries where interest rates are now very low. So there, there is very little scope for interest rates to come further down. But in countries like Spain, in which, in which you are paying a spread over the German bunds of uh, close to five full points, co the confidence theory is again relevant because if by, by, by sending the right signals to the outside world and to potential buyers of your debt, you, you reduce uh, from five to say two full points your bond spreads, actually you, you will see that the confidence theory is, is not a theory, but uh, it's, it's a real factor that you need to take into account. Thank you. There's so much that one could talk about, but um, mm -hmm. about the origins of the euro, I, I think it's, it, I do simplify, I think, in the book. The, uh, there, was a, there was a political project in Brussels, but it was also a project by people who were very, uh, who believed that, that by having uh, credibility on inflation, that you could get low interest rates. I mean, they, that so it's an old joke. It's a twenty-year-old joke among among my friends that that the euro uh, was actually a, a plot by by Italian uh, officials to have German central bankers. So there was a <laughs> there was a real sense in which that was part of the story also. Uh, so fair enough. Um, I want to talk. That, uh, this is this is actually uh, I, I think it's a significant question. Uh, does does Keynesian does a Keynesian argument made at a time like this lead to uh, excuses for fiscal irresponsibility uh, in, in, in other times? Because it, very much, Keynes himself uh, was, was all for uh, fiscal austerity when, when the economy was, was, was strong. And, uh, and I like to think that I have been also. I actually was, was very concerned about budget deficits uh, at, at, at earlier times in the United States, and and uh, um, and I don't know if I can give a universal answer, but I can say if, uh, this is where I become. I know the United States well, and in, in the in the case of the United States, although uh, we certainly have had our share of fiscal irresponsibility, we wasted we wasted the last decade uh, um, at a time when the economy was strong. We should have been paying down debt, and instead we. We, we did not. Uh, that had nothing to do with Keynesian logic. Uh, our, our, if we have a bias towards fiscal irresponsibility, it is coming instead from, a, from an ideological war. Uh, the, the, uh, in, in the United States, the, the, the story has been that, that um, uh, one, one party has adopted a strategy of cutting taxes uh, uh, under all circumstances in an attempt to uh, starve the beast, uh, the, by, by creating deficits through tax cuts to then force cuts in, in the welfare state. And because it turns out that people actually like the welfare state, uh, uh, those cuts don't tend to not come or not come on a sufficient scale. So we do have a structural bias towards deficits, but it's not coming, it's not, it's not the fault of John Maynard Keynes and it's not the fault of, of, of me. Uh, it's, it's the fault of, of our political division. So, I, um, yes, I mean, you're right. I mean, no, no, uh, uh, no, every, every, every good idea can be turned to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to evil, but I, I actually think that has not been our problem. So, uh, uh, on behalf of John Maynard Keynes, I'd like to plead innocent <laughs> on this particular charge. <laughs> I have one short remark. Um, Two remarks. One is about uh, public choice, that is the economic analysis of politics. Uh, we've observed time and time again that in good times, governments don't retrench <coughs> and don't repay their debt. That is not because they're evil or because there's something wrong in Keynes's theory. It's because the way that politics function make it virtually impossible 
for governments to work in this way, retrench when you have good times and spend you are go when you're good. In fact, there's a ratchet effect. You spend more when things are bad, and then you don't go back again. And this has been studied by that part of economic theory, which is called public choice. Then the second remark I want to make is about the uh, money supply. Now, if I, I've looked at the figures for money supply, and it's not the fact, not the case, that money has been unduly expanded. In fact, as Professor Krugman says, it's pretty difficult to increase the amount of money when your rate of interest is very near zero. So uh, it's not the case that we've had too much money and that this expansion of money should have gone into inflation. There was a time when there was too much money, which is in the, from 201 to 207, uh, and that's when we got asset inflation. But if one looks at those figures, they are not figures of money expansion. We cannot go into this here because we don't have the data, but I would like to call attention to everybody uh, to these two facts. Public choice about how really politics function and money supply is not as easy to expand as many people have understood. Uh, I did fight the euro because I thought it was a political affair. I tend to think that money, religion, sport, and so on should not be infected by politics, but there you are. <laughs> not, not one of those can possibly be insulated from politics. Certainly not sport. Uh, well, uh, you, you haven't been here today. That's right, I've been, uh, I can see that, actually. Uh, by the way, the, the best, I, I want to, I'm going to give someone else credit, the best remark I've heard to explain the problem we've had was actually um, uh, uh, Ryan Avent of The Economist uh, said that, uh, uh, that during the, the Euro, Euro, Euro 2012, during, during the uh, game between Germany and Greece, uh, Germany actually had possession of the ball. Uh, I believe 66% 60, of the time, and the Germans want to know why the Greeks couldn't do that too. Uh, <laughs> that's that's your, your fundamental problem. The Germans think that everyone should be running a trade surplus. And, uh, um, the, and, and, and by the way, I, I, I appreciate, I think the public choice, uh, you do need to think about the political economy very much. Uh, but I thought we've just had a rather dramatic refutation of the notion that fiscal stimulus leads to a permanent increase in spending. Uh, certainly in the United States, when, when, the, when the original Obama, the original inadequate Obama, uh, Obama Recovery Act was proposed, there were many people wisely saying, oh, well, th that spending will never go away. None of it remained. We had a moderate program of, of infrastructure spending has not been renewed. We had moderate aid to state and local governments has expired. We even, we've even had a withdrawal of extended unemployment benefits despite the fact that we continue to have a record number of long-term unemployed. So there's been no hint at all of these things turning into permanent government programs. Uh, on the contrary, the, the actual way that the political dynamics worked was that the, the, uh, the stimulus was withdrawn much, much too soon. So maybe that's an exceptional uh, story, but, but certainly this time around, the, the wisdom about what always happens when the government increases spending turned out to be 100% wrong. But government is increasing in size, uh, securely. Only, yeah, all, uh, from, well, from the middle of the, tw of the 20th century. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah right. we've mm -hmm. taken on some new roles. And, uh, some new roles. And, and, the, uh, and the U.S. government, actually most governments, but the U.S. government is, is uh, as people say, it's an insurance company for old people that also has an army. Um, and, because we, uh, and because we have more old people and because healthcare becomes more expensive, the government has grown. But that's a, that's a very different kind of, of dynamic. <laughs> if, if I may, in, in, in the case of Spain, to the extent that we have twin deficits, one uh, still, well, no, no uh, luckily enough, uh, small. Uh, the current account deficit is going to be 1%, say. And, and we are running still a huge uh, budget deficit. In, in the case of Spain, there is a strong case for budget austerity. Which, which does not apply elsewhere. And, and, and what I see is, is the risk by, that by reading your book and, and your plea yes. for expansionary fiscal policy in, in other parts of the world, people might get the wrong message here, that here, and, and probably that was a mistake of President Zapatero, that he, he took anti-cyclical action when we didn't have any, any room of maneuver. 
Mm. He, probably because he, he, he mixed up in his mind he mixed the subprime up. crisis yeah. with a crisis. In, in your book, you, you make it quite clear that the, we have a, a crisis of our own, which was going to explode no matter what. But in, in public discussions, politicians are not always so subtle, and they may get the wrong impression that uh, uh, you are arguing for fiscal expansion also here in Spain, which okay. I don't think you are. No, yeah. actually, I think I should clarify, because I think this is important. Um, no, uh, Spain cannot do the fiscal expansion. Um, I think the question, the relevant question, but it's not going to. The question for Spain is, what if, what if the budget targets are missed? What if the economy performs worse and, and, the, and, and, the, uh, and the deficit target is missed? Should there be more austerity to hit that deficit target? And there I think you can make a pretty good case that the answer is no. That in fact, uh, it, since the, the Spain needs, uh, it probably still has a long run structural deficit, but, but that's something that, that needs to be coped with o over the long run. Um, the, um, it needs, it, it cannot actually aim for full employment because it has to, it has to at least have wage restraint. And so it's going to have to have a, a, a lot of slack in the labor market, but does an extra one or two percent of GDP of fiscal austerity on top of what is already happening, does that do any good? Is that going to make Spain's borrowing costs lower? Uh, I don't think so. Is it going to make any significant impact on the long run Spanish fiscal position? It's hard to see. All it will do is actually deepen the, the depression. So, uh, so clearly a, a Keynesian fiscal stimulus is not on, but, but, um, but further pro-cyclical fiscal policy additional austerity if the economy underperforms, I think you can make a very strong case that that is a bad idea, even though Spain has a, a serious budget problem. I'm mm -hmm. sure the chairman doesn't want me to say that. Austerity is the wrong word. Uh, what we're trying to do in Spain is to change the structure of the state, the structure of the welfare state, because it's broke, and we have to change it. And it's not saying we simply want to cut. No, we want to make Spain into a better society because it's not working as it is. <laughs> that's that. That's the. And I, 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 we can have oh, that argument morality. elsewhere. But that, but that's hijacking. That's right. The, the hijacking. Uh, it's hijacking the crisis on behalf of a different agenda. No, the crisis uh, has happened on its own. No, look, look at the countries that are doing fine right <laughs> now. Uh, we have those countries with tiny welfare states and no social guarantees, like Sweden and Denmark and Finland and Austria and Germany. Right? They all have. They all have extremely effective. Highly protected. They reformed states. it, which is what I'm but saying. They're, but they're, they, they reformed it. Well, but it's, not, uh, not cutting. Uh, no, anyway, but that's uh, anyway. But yeah. that's uh, yeah. that, that's a, a, a constant. I, I've had these. Uh, yeah. I've had these discussions in in, in Britain, and uh, people start by talking about deficits, and they end up uh, by they changing end, the up, welfare. It state. ends up that the real agenda is actually just to shrink the welfare state. No, no. Uh, I think that there are a couple of countries service. in which th this question comes to the fore, and uh, they are very interesting. The first one is, is Holland, and the second one is France. And I would side with Professor Krugman and probably against uh, Professor Schwartz that this is wrong, definitely for Holland, who is a big credit country, mm -hmm. and also for France as well, now to be obsessed with, with meeting deficit targets be because they, they don't have the problem that we have had in Spain, uh, in the, particularly in the case of Holland, they, they run a surplus of 6% of GDP. In the case of France, they are with a slight deficit, but um, I, I don't think now is, is the time for, for France to, to improve its uh, structural budget deficit, then, then uh, it should leave it for, for, for a future when, when the economy is, is, is booming. And, and I don't know whether Mr. Krugman has any views on, on that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't done enough homework on France. But, uh, but my, my initial reaction is that what we're, what we're seeing in, in the press reports today, which is that the budget's going to fall short and so Hollande has to find further cuts that sounds, that sounds like a bad idea. That sounds mm -hmm. like this is, is a, a mistaken reaction. Uh, France has issues, but, uh, but 14 billion euros or something of further cuts is not going to make any difference to those issues. Bien, el tiempo es escaso y el interés enorme. Tenemos una verdadera avalancha de preguntas que vienen vía Twitter de las salas contiguas y, y creo que es el momento oh eh, de abrir eh, el debate a la sala. Comenzando por... Thanks, uh, Professor Krugman, for your book, and thanks for your fight against the, the wrong ideas. Uh, I, I have, if, if you look your, your chart about the union level costs in, in Spain, yeah. 
and you read your book about international trade, you, you expect that the, the uh, export of goods in Spain ah, had Spain. worse uh, behavior than in Germany, no? And you uh, estimate from the world economic outlook and the, the Spanish exports and the German export, the, the Spanish export growth 50% uh, uh, more since uh, 1919 uh, than German. No? You look only from uh, 2008, the behavior is even better. We have now a surplus in the in the trade balance with the, the partners of the Eurozone. So, no, what is no, what is wrong? Your book, <laughs> your uh, chart, or your ideas, and after other all the data that, that, that I have, no, in a debt deflation, as Irving Fisher say, we had to reflate in the debt. But we we have Germans inside the Eurozone, so it's very difficult to reflate the debt with, with inflation. So in this situation, you had to ask. Uh, a bail-in or a bail-out, and the, the cost and benefit analysis is the complicated situation is you are in the euro and, and you have a, a very little maneuver to, to, to margin and, and you have a, a problem of the globalization of the financial market. You, you, uh, you do a bail-in and you provoke a run in the, in the financial market, so uh, what is your opinion about this question? No? Okay, uh, wow, it's too much. Um, we will lose the audience, but I want to say the, the Spanish export story is, is, a, is an important debate, and I actually spent quite a lot of time uh, working on it before coming here, and then, and then no one until now has asked me about it. And if I, and if I start to answer, we'll go on for an hour. So, uh, uh, but it is true. Sp it, it, one thing you might have expected to see, uh, we, we do see Spain move into massive current account deficit, but we don't see, Sp we don't see Spain losing export market share. Uh, instead, it's coming on the import side. And my understanding of what's probably going on is that Spain, we have an overlay of underlying structural change. Spain is becoming a more open economy all through this process. And, and it is becoming increasingly an export-oriented, but also an import-oriented economy, so that the export market looks as if there isn't a competitive problem. But if you look at the balance, it looks very much as if there is a competitive problem, uh, coupled with the fact that the Spanish economy grew, uh, labor force and so on, and diversified over that period, which tends to ex expand export market share. And I, I wrote a paper about that 20 mm -hmm. years ago. But, the, uh, um, so I, but that's, it is, uh, I've, there is, a, there is something which, at least on, on the surface, looks like an anomaly, and it's, uh, it takes a long academic discussion to try and, and hash it out, but, uh, but I think it, 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 it cannot be. Uh, the, the, every other piece of evidence points to a, a massive loss of competitiveness, so we have to ask why, why does, not, not whether that's true, but why does the export number look odd in that context? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I can answer the rest of that. I think we should have let some other questions come in. But I, yeah, I mean, the, um, yeah, it's uh, being the professor here. Good question, and it's uh, it's it's worth uh, it's worth a lot of discussion, but not not tonight, not here. Muchas gracias. Sí, eso, eso sí. Les ruego por favor que se presenten eh, al formular sus eh, preguntas y que por favor sean lo más breves posibles, porque tenemos que aprovechar el privilegio de tener a nuestros invitados aquí. Tenemos una segunda palabra aquí, Javier. Uh, hello, hello. My name is Javier Van. I'm, I'm teaching in University of Juan Carlos here in Madrid. I, I have a question. I have calculated uh, two years ago that uh, the the, uh, the weighted average of the of the cost of the issuance or the bonds issuance in different countries of the eurozone, uh, if you if, if we calculated the, the this average, and we 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 calculate uh, to the cost that uh, a common uh, issuance uh, could be could be done, then uh, it is it is clear in my opinion that. Uh, uh, a common issuance of bonds uh, by the Eurozone could uh, be uh, much uh, uh, cheaper for all together, and then it could be possible that, uh, that even those who uh, can think to get to today that they will lose by, by a common issuance would uh, even eventually uh, earn a lot of money by, by making a common, a common issuance. What do you think about a common treasury for the Eurozone? Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I think it, ra it really would be to the advantage of all of Europe if it had a common treasury, if it issued common bonds. The trouble is uh, you require a degree of, of, of political trust to, to do that. And, and uh, you know, maybe if such a proposal had been floated in 2005 or 2006, it might have happened. But now exactly is exactly the time when it can't be done. Um, and, and more broadly, the, um, uh, 
I think it is very difficult to, to have any kind of common bond issuance without basically having a central government. Um, and, and this is the huge difference between the United States and, and the Eurozone, uh, the, um, that we have the central government, that uh, uh, by the numbers, Florida and Spain have a lot in common, comparable size housing bubbles, comparable size busts, but of course enormous, well, the, essentially the retirement costs and healthcare costs for Florida are federal, not state, and that's, that's why Florida is not in a crisis the way Spain is. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I don't believe, I, I would love to see true federal solutions for Europe. I think that is, that is ideally what should happen. But I don't see, it, it seems impossible to, to envision that happening. I don't expect to see it happen in my lifetime unless there are some major advances in medicine uh, that extend that lifetime. I, uh, it took the United States uh, you know, a, a, a couple of centuries uh, to, to, to achieve that, that level of trust. And I, I don't think we can do it. Uh, it, it's, it would be the right answer, but it's not. It's not. So, so we look for imperfect fixes coming out of things like monetary policy. Bien, antes de pasar de nuevo otra palabra al público, permítanme que he dado el, eh, la avalancha de, de preguntas que nos están llegando a través de Twitter y de la sala contigua, pues de entrada a una de las preguntas que nos llegan de fuera. Tiene que ver con el papel de los economistas en esta crisis y como pueden imaginar no salimos muy bien parados. Entonces, leo dos de ellas. ¿no? Eh, Profesor Krugman, ¿are the economists able to determine the optimum balance between austerity and growth-friendly fiscal policies? Y unida a esta, after this devastating crisis, do we need a bailout of economic thought? Oh, wow. Uh, no, yes, I mean, I, I've written about that and made quite a few enemies uh, within the profession. <laughs> uh, we, we've, no, this has been a, uh, one way, I, I, the, the way I put it, I think it may be in the book, but I certainly have said it elsewhere. Uh, if this crisis had happened 40 years ago, this crisis had happened in 1971, we would have had a better policy response than we have actually had. Uh, and part of the reason is that politically things have shifted. In the United States, we, we used to have uh, much more bipartisanship. Uh, well, we, now we have none. We, we used to have substantial ability to, to cooperate between the parties, and we don't to have that now. Uh, but the other thing that has happened uh, over the last 40 years is that we've had uh, uh, 40 years of, of macroeconomic uh, theory which has been, for the most part, I'm afraid, has actually moved us backwards. Uh, that, that we've actually uh, ended up losing a lot of knowledge. So the, you, you quoted the, uh, the line that, that a lot of us are saying that, that, uh, that new ideas come from reading old books. <laughs> it turns out that, that reading Irving Fisher from 1933 or John Maynard Keynes from 1936 uh, is, or Walter Badgett from the 1880s, is a better guide to the situation we're in than, uh, than at least 50% of the articles in macroeconomics that have been published in journals these past 30 years. Um, so no, the, the economics profession is, has failed really, really badly. Uh, and, uh, and should you trust economists? Uh, well, you should trust me, but aside from that, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, honest, honestly, no, we've, it's, it's been terrible. It's I'm been a disaster. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and the, the degree of dissension is, is, is an important part of our problem right now. My name is Pedro Blanco, Professor Krugman. Thank you for being here and welcome to Spain. Uh, thank my, you. My, uh, I, I, I have to say that I really liked your book from the very beginning because you start the book by, by dedicating it to the unemployed. And my question is, is, if, is that your way of uh, saying that the solution to the, crisis, to the economic crisis has to take into account the people? Yeah, I mean, but and this, is, this is, I mean, there are so many things that, that are going wrong, but one of the things, uh, particularly when I started working on the book, which was, um, I mean, it didn't, it, it, I was working on it to some extent you know, last year, and, uh, and at that point, unemployment had almost disappeared from the discussion in, in the United States, and I think in Europe, but certainly in the United States, was all budgets and maybe a little bit about GDP, and somehow we'd forgotten that, that the main cost is, is the unemployed. It's not just, money is actually secondary. It's unemployment, lack of jobs. Uh, and that's, that should be the centerpiece. And, and we have far too many meetings of, uh, 
of, of I'm, I'm in those meetings sometimes, of, of serious people of wearing suits, uh, uh, talking about, about numbers and, and completely losing track of, of what this is doing. And, and it's, and, and by the way, it's not, it's not, um, I know, I mean, I, I'm a, I, have a, I have a sheltered life. I, I, don't, I don't have any worries about money. I don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, or losing health care. And, and the people I know mostly don't. But nonetheless, I know people in America, quite a few, who are suffering from unemployment. Uh, relatives, friends who have lost their jobs and see no prospect of getting another one. Yeah, young people who are going to graduate from college and don't know what they're going to do because there are no jobs. This is a, an immense human catastrophe. Whatever else we say, we should not for, lose track of that, and that's the reason why why there has to, that's that's the reason for the exclamation point in the book's title, right? Because it because it's human. It's it's an enormous human cost that we're paying right now. Buenas tardes. Soy Carlos de Lama. Tengo dos preguntas: uno para el profesor Spars y otro para el profesor Krumman. Si la salida es por la vía de la oferta, significa eso? que tendríamos que tener una salida microeconómica, es decir, que cada agente social, cada empresa, cada ama de casa tiene que resolver su propia crisis recortando costes y siendo eficiente en lo que hace y por tanto el gobierno tiene que limitarse a sacar de la crisis su negocio, es decir, al Estado, de forma que sus servicios sean eficientes y que sus finanzas estén saneadas. Al profesor Krumman, eh, si miramos y sumamos el déficit de los Estados Unidos con la masa monetaria en circulación y la deuda derivada, eso suma 788 billones europeos, millones de millones de dólares. Es el 518% del PIB. ¿No habría que empezar a pensar en el problema del dólar e irnos olvidando del euro? You are in Europe, so, of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> first of all, I mean, obviously, people with people with money to invest don't agree. Uh, they they seem to think that the that U.S. Treasuries are a pretty safe investment. They could be wrong, but that's uh, but that is worth uh, worth bearing in mind. You know, all the you see these enormous numbers about future. Uh, about, about U.S. implied debt, uh, the implicit liabilities. Um, and a couple of things you need to understand about that is that, um, that they are enormous relative to GDP, but these are liabilities calculated you know, into the infinite future. So you should be comparing them with GDP into the infinite future. And so the number is not nearly as big as the one you're saying. It ends up being, being a much more modest looking sum. Um, the other thing is that the U.S. budget deficit projections are dominated by the assumption that our incredibly expensive healthcare system will continue to grow even more expensive. Everything you see in those, those projections about U.S. debt is driven by the assumption that the cost of Medicare will continue to rise 2% faster than GDP basically forever. And maybe that will happen, although actually it can't happen because we'll run out of money, but maybe we'll actually manage to uh, reform. And if we could, uh, if we could reduce U.S. healthcare costs to, uh, to uh, the European average healthcare cost, uh, suddenly the U.S. would have no deficit problems at all. Uh, and that's not going to happen overnight, but, uh, but you know, I, I always say the U.S. does not have a deficit problem. The U.S. has a healthcare problem. And that's a very different story. And, uh, and you might say, in that case, why don't you favor healthcare reform? And the answer is, I do. And I've spent a lot of time pushing for that, and we'll continue to do so. Mm -hmm. well, see. La pregunta eh, tiene interés porque distingue entre lo que hacen los individuos y lo que hace el Estado. Los individuos, naturalmente, si los incentivos están bien, persiguen su interés y trabajan lo mejor que pueden para su felicidad, no es, somos quien para decirles. Pero el Estado tiene un papel mayor que el de gestionar los servicios públicos de forma eficaz. El Estado no existe. El Estado son los individuos puestos de acuerdo para determinados servicios. Y uno de esos servicios es el marco legislativo, el marco de incentivos y el marco institucional, que es deficiente en muchos países, especialmente eh, lo es en España. Y por lo tanto, no es decir, las familias, las empresas se ocupan de lo suyo, el Estado que sea barato, es cómo los ciudadanos nos ponemos de acuerdo para hacer un Estado 
que esté al servicio, que cree un marco en el cual nosotros los individuos podemos prosperar. Gracias. Sí, tenemos una pregunta de fondo. Les informo que somos trending topic en las redes sociales hace hora y media. Eh, gracias. Soy Carlos Salas Pequeño de Información.com. Carlos Hello. Salas de Información.com. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Thank you, the three speakers, for the debate. Uh, Professor Krupman, I haven't read your book already, uh, and I don't know if you write about the following question. Uh, mm, we are living in uh, a very difficult time in Europe, but I guess that in the United States you lived or you had similar problems 200 years ago. I would like to know if you have compared the history of the problems of the United States of America and the foundation of the dollar with the history of uh, the foundation of the European Union and the euro. Are there lessons we can learn about? Thank you. Ah, okay. Um, it's a big topic. It's a big topic. Um, quick answer. Um, the rules of economics change slowly, but they do change. And uh, all of the things that, that I'm writing about in this book, the, the Well, basically, the business cycle issues. Uh, the business cycle is not, we have not always had business cycles. We probably had the first modern business cycle in, in Britain in the 1820s. We didn't, you didn't have recessions the way we do now. Uh, we, uh, uh, my uh, former colleague, Peter Tamman, the economic historian, said that we didn't really have a, a true recession in the United States, uh, although we There are official recessions. We didn't have anything that felt like a modern recession probably until the 1870s. So the, when the dollar was formed, when the U.S. became a monetary union, we were an agrarian society with, uh, with, uh, with no large-scale industry and not even that much small-scale industry. It just, wasn't, it just wasn't a useful, it isn't a useful comparison. Uh, so I, I don't think it's, it's, it's terribly enlightening, uh, much, much as I would like. I'm, I'm a great admirer of Alexander Hamilton, who created the, the modern, uh, you know, created the, the, uh, in a lot of ways the foundation for the, for the U.S. government, but, but the world he lived in, uh, much as I like to talk about history, the world, the world of 1789, which is when we really, really created the United States, uh, it was, was not very much like the world of, of 2012. Uh, Enrique Alberola, uh, thank you for, for this presentation. And I admire much of your work and much of your opinion. So don't take my question as an accusation or a criticism, just more right. rather a philosophical question. Uh, you probably agree that this is basically a crisis or also a crisis of confidence. And you belong to this bunch of very influential economists which shape the confidence of the, of the market. You are not a price taker of the, in the market of ideas or sentiment. Right. You shape confidence too. And most of you are permanently gloomy and negative by anything, any policy reaction. You find them inadequate, too slow, too timid. And in the end, you are being really honest in academic terms because you are purists. But sometimes I feel that you don't take into account the restraints or the constraints of the real world and the political process. And in the end, what you do is basically attack negatively to the sentiment. So my question is whether somehow, how do you feel about it? Right. If you have a sense of responsibility in that sense, or what's your view on that? Okay. Thank you. So I actually don't agree that we have primarily a crisis of confidence. I think there is a, there is a certainly, a, there are some, 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 issues of self-fulfilling panic, but I think those are not actually central right now. I think actually, for the most part, we have a, a, real, uh, a real problem of excessive leverage, an overhang of debt. These are the things that are the, are the core. Um, and so happy thoughts don't solve that. Uh, you need actual policies to solve that. Uh, there is, um, uh, I, I worry about, about the issue. You describe uh, the, uh, I, being honest is is I, is is what I'm there for. Uh, certainly, I have readers uh, who are expecting me to to tell the truth as best I can, um, and I don't think that there's any problem with doing that now. Um, if we get into a state of acute crisis, uh, at what point? The famous line uh, by by Justice Brandeis in the United States, which who said that the right of 
of free speech does not include the right to yell fire in a crowded theater. Right? Uh, to create a panic is not acceptable. And, 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 uh, and does there come a point where, where you have to muzzle yourself? And uh, I worry about that. And I'll try to, to see if I, if I see that happening. But so, this, for the past, certainly in Europe, for the past several years, um, what we've had is um, a parade of, of prominent influential figures claiming that everything is all right. Uh, every as assurance from, uh, from, from the ECB and from the, uh, from the European Commission and that, that everything is on track and it's inconceivable that Greece will default on its debts. Um, you know, which has done more damage, my gloominess or their uh, ridiculous optimism? I think so far, so far pessimism has been, uh, has, been more, has been more socially responsible as well as being more realistic. <laughs> Estamos ya agotando casi el tiempo disponible para el debate. Tenemos dos preguntas solicitadas aquí y aquí. Eh, buenas tardes, good afternoon. I'm Diego Sánchez de la Cruz. I'm an analyst at eh, Libertad Digital, Libre Mercado, a free market eh, online newspaper here in Spain. I have two questions. One is for eh, Professor Schwarz, one is for Professor Krogman. Eh, the one for Professor Krogman. There, there was an article back in the year 2002 when you urged the Federal Reserve to create a housing bubble to replace the, um, te high, the tech bubble, the, the, the Nasdaq bubble. Uh, looking back into what you wrote 10 years ago, this is the 10 year anniversary of your prescription, and uh, we've seen that both the US and, and our country have really suffered from the active promotion of this uh, housing bubble that was active, not just from a monetary policy perspective, but also from a political perspective, as we've seen here with the savings banks, or we've seen in the United States with semi-public institutions and the guidance given to. Fanny May and Freddie Mac. Besides this, I would like to ask to Professor uh, Schwartz and also to Professor Krugman, being his, uh, done some of his best work in the area of commerce, about the issues of protectionism today and what uh, they represent, what challenges they may represent to coming out of this crisis, given the fact that in the, thir in the, in the 30s, in the decade of the 30s, which is a decade that Professor Krugman is talking about a lot lately, uh, the Smooth Hardly Act and many other tariff barriers had a lot to do with the creation of a global economic downturn. Thank you. Okay, um, so on, on, the, on the first one, uh, I think the, if I may say, for Christ's sake, give me a break. Uh, <laughs> if you actually read that article, I actually read it, I was joking. I was saying that I was talking about the difficulty of responding uh, purely with monetary policy to the, to the kind of slump we were then expressing. And it's a, it's a, a measure, of, I might say, of the intellectual bankruptcy. Of, of a large part of this debate, that the best they could do is keep on claiming that I was actually advocating the creation of a housing bubble. I, I, I obviously wasn't doing that. Um, and I don't, I guess I don't believe the story, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and the other piece of this, the claim that it was Fannie and Freddie and all of that, that that's in the book. So I read the book and discover that it, it's, it's, it is, I, I call, uh, as I say, it, it, it is actually, the, and this is not my phrase, uh, as Barry Ritholtz was a very apolitical, uh, analyst, uh, but, but he says that's the big lie of, of, of U.S. Uh, economic debate. It, it's just not true. It's not what happened. So, so uh, leave it at that. Um, a word about protectionism. Uh, yeah, I mean, I still am a, a big defender of, of open world markets because uh, not out of some religious faith in free trade, but because it's terribly important, especially for, for the world's poor countries, that they have access to, to open world markets. Um, protectionism has been one of the that's been the dog that did not bark. We've had, I mean, there's been some protectionist moves in this crisis, but if you had told me, told anyone uh, five years ago that we would have 11% uh, unemployment in, in the Eurozone, and that we would have, and with, with the unemployment rate rising after, after years and years of crisis, and that we'd have uh, um, 4 million Americans who've been unemployed for more than a year, which has, hasn't happened since the 1930s, and that there would be so little in the way of protectionist responses, that there would not, in fact, be any ongoing trade wars, I think people would have said, you're crazy. We would have expected to see a huge protectionist reaction. So what's actually happened is that the institutions of global trade, the World Trade Organization, the rules of international trade, have actually held incredibly well under, under extreme stress. Of all the things that have gone wrong, protectionism is not one of them. That we've done very well on that front. Professor Krugman is right about the situation regarding protectionism. It could have been much, much worse. The only 
my only remark is that we have too many bilateral treaties and that the uh, round of the World Trade Organization is not off the ground. And that I would like to see. Uh, yeah. uh, mm. I think we would agree Definitely. on that. would like yeah, to see yeah. prosper. My old teacher, J Jagdish Bhagwan, talks about sp the spaghetti bowl. That's there are all these strands linking countries. Yeah, that's a, that's a mess. But it's, but, it's not a very, but it's not doing a great deal of harm. Right. It's, it's just not, it, not the way you'd want to do it. But of, of my, if that doesn't make my top 25 list of things that I worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Tenemos una última pregunta aquí. Uh, hi, my name is Livia. Um, I would like to, well, thanks. Uh, first, thank you for, for being here. And I'll try to be very brief. So yes. I, I think we're all discussing here um, solutions for the European crisis. And what I get from your speech, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, the European Central Bank should do some measures in order to, well, give, um, inject monetary solutions to, to Spain. For example, by creating money or buying our bonds, because obviously our interest rates are very high and this would lead to, to smaller interest rates. Uh, my question simply is, uh, this is called inflation, right? Uh, don't you think inflation is theft? Because since it decreases uh, the purchase power of people, uh, this is actually theft. It, it would lead the people, ironically, to austerity back because what you have doesn't really uh, pay what you thought it would. And on the other hand, everybody would be paying the cost of a crisis which when actually the real responsibles for the crisis wouldn't be implied. So this is simply my question, if inflation is not considered that theft. Well, I think it's, you know, it, um, inflation is only theft if you consider anything that people didn't expect that, that affects some people for the worst theft. I mean, there is no promise. A euro note does not promise on it that it's going to have a, a fixed purchasing power in terms of goods. That was not part of the deal. Um, a, uh, this, uh, a bond, uh, there are bonds where you are protected against inflation and, and they are inflation protected bonds and, and people pay a premium for that. And that's, uh, so it's not theft in any legal sense. Um, and if you're worried about people who are not responsible for the crisis paying the price for the crisis, um, how about the 25% of, uh, of Spain's labor force who are unemployed? How many of those people caused this crisis. I mean, this, uh, uh, what's actually happening is an enormous price is being paid by, by, by unemployed workers all across the Western world. Uh, and if, uh, if I can find, if, if a little bit of inflation, not, no one is talking, uh, no one is talking Zimbabwe, no one is even talking even 5%. If 3% if inflation is a way to get some of those innocent victims out of their misery, uh, I would think that is, uh, that is, that's something well worth doing. Uh, it's, it's a, it seems to me a strange kind of morality that is desperately concerned that, that uh, the people who bought bonds might be somewhat surprised by, uh, by a modest erosion of the value of those bonds. Um, and that's, that's a terrible sin, but that having people who did nothing wrong be unemployed and have their lives destroyed is, uh, is just part of the way the capitalist system is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. ¿Algún comentario final? Pedro, sí. Manuel. I'll, I'll make a, a short comment which comes, I think, very to the point of what we've just heard. Mm, I feel whenever I am in one of these discussions or when I read some of the newspaper that publishes uh, the interesting articles by Professor Krugman that I'm in the wrong in the morally wrong and so, sort of morally inferior. And that the people who care for the unemployed and care for growth are morally superior because I care for something else. Um, in fact, the, mm, if, there are 20, if there's a 25% unemployment in Spain or 50% of the young, I've been fighting that all my life, especially by trying to see whether the political and economic dispensation we have causes that, and I'm against that because I care for the unemployed, very much so. I have many students who are unemployed, I, mean, I know the unemployed, but I always feel I'm in the morally wrong. I'm dogmatic. We, there's a lot of dogmatism, and of course, uh, people who are on the side of 
Professor Krugman, uh, um, love humanity and are open to argument and so on, but we are sort of pig-headed and really don't want to, uh, to make people happier than they are. And this is something that I feel all the time, and I felt, if I may say so, in some of the Professor Krugman's answers. The lady, the young lady who says that perhaps inflation takes money away from somebody, I'm sure she doesn't think that 25% unemployment is right and that it's the normal thing in the capitalist system. I'm sure she cares much more for the unemployed than for inflation. That kind of answer puts us on the wrong foot. This is the, uh, what I was going to say. I'm, I'm, I want to end by saying I feel privileged to have this discussion and I'm happy that we were all able to put our ideas forward and I hope the next time um, the t tables are not turned on me by saying I'm the dog dogmatic person who really is not quite quite all right, doesn't really care for all those unemployed. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in closing on my side, I would like to praise Mr. Krupen Courage because he's, he's willing to espouse openly his views, uh, particularly in the states where, where pundits and republicans are very strong and they criticize him regularly. And I, I don't know whether uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the former Secretary of Defense of the US, is one of his favorite authors. I don't think he is. But uh, he, you, you, you may want to read his exactly. autobiography because there is a line which, which applies pretty well to you, which says, if you are not criticized, you may not be doing your job well. <laughs> right. Uh, OK. Um, I agree with that. That is yeah, definitely true. We Actually, all agree. <laughs> Very much, yes. If, uh, but to, to anyone who, who, who is going to write for the public or speak to the public, if you don't make a lot of people angry, uh, you're wasting your time. So uh, <laughs> definitely. Um, no, I, I think I should just conclude that this has been a really interesting discussion uh, and important. I mean, these are, um, maybe that is what we should say, that these, these are, uh, we, <laughs> we, we may hate economists, we may think that the economists have been no help. The trouble is we have uh, this economic crisis is, is now the central issue in the world, and, and it has to be fixed somehow. It has to be fixed uh, uh, by doing the best we can. And I'm trying to give you what I think are, are the, my best shot at the right answers. Uh, I assume that everyone else is doing the same. Yes. Um, and I'd just like to, to say thank you for, uh, thank, thanks to the foundation for this great forum to talk about them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, may, may the right ideas prevail, uh, which means me, but anyway, may, may the right yeah. ideas prevail. <laughs> One final question. How, how is your book selling in Germany? Yeah. I don't think we have a German edition yet. Oh, you have to worry. Uh, they're, they're trying to rearrange it because it's it's very difficult editing because all of the verbs have to come in the last ten pages. So no, anyway, sorry. So we don't. I don't have a German edition yet. Muy bien, pues muchas gracias a todos. Hemos excedido con creces el tiempo disponible. Y eso sí. Como señaló, como señaló María del Pino, eh, en la introducción estarán de acuerdo con nosotros en que ha merecido la pena haber venido. La verdad es que se han quedado muchas preguntas sin responder. Pedimos disculpas porque no ha sido posible. Algunas tan sumamente elaboradas como esta que quiero destacar y que quiero entregarle al profesor Krugman porque realmente, para que vea que nuestros invitados vienen con, con eh, el trabajo hecho. Eh, y por otra parte, simplemente señalarles como datos que eh, oh uh, en este momento la cifra de personas siguiéndonos vía Twitter está en 733.282 personas y todavía quedan los retweets correspondientes que nos han seguido en directo, profesor, 800 personas a través de la FRPTV oh y que, por supuesto, eh, eh, ello responde al nivel que eh, se ha desarrollado en este debate por nuestros tres invitados. Muchas gracias a los tres y esperamos tenerles de nuevo pronto en la casa, pero esta vez para presentar el nuevo libro del profesor Krugman, que debe llamarse De cómo fuimos capaces de recuperar entre todos la senda de la prosperidad. ¿Qué le parece? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, okay. Professor.